All right. So welcome everybody to our um, start of our broadcast here. We are getting ready. We're bringing in some of our participants here. Uh, my name is Giacomo Fabrizio. I am a uh, physiotherapist at Nobleton Physiotherapy and Aurora Sports Medicine Professionals. Um, with me today is, is uh, Dr. Mallory Reinthaler. She's a, a naturopathic doctor here at uh, Nobleton Physiotherapy and also uh, at Aurora Sports Medicine Professionals. So uh, we're just waiting for attendees to uh, to join us. Um, this is a little bit of a slow time while we wait for people to come mm -hmm. in on, on our um, webinar here, uh, but we'll get started really promptly and um, make sure that uh, we get everybody uh, well informed and not wait too long because I'm sure everybody has uh, other things to do tonight so we don't want to keep you waiting. It's a full house tonight so it, it, uh, <laughs> it's going to be lots of fun. It is a full house tonight. Thank you again everybody for joining us. Um, we're, we're recording the webinar tonight. If anybody is uh, wondering, the webinar will be uh, posted on both websites, both nobletonphysiotherapy.ca and Aurora Sports Med. Uh, .ca. So if, if you, you have to check out early, uh, feel free. If you want to catch up with it uh, later on, you can go to our website and um, Mallory is going to uh, uh, reach out to everybody later on for any one-on-one uh, -on -one questions that you may have. Uh, before we get started, we're going to get started very shortly. Uh, most of our attendees are joined up here so far. We have uh, about 70 people so far. Uh, before we get started, um, Feel free, Mallory's going to go through a little bit of housekeeping here, but uh, feel free to ask any questions, post them in the chat. She'll go over that again in a second. Uh, if you have any uh, really specific questions, um, Mallory's going to give you some information at the end that you can reach out to her and, um, and, and ask some, you know, maybe a little, little more uh, personal questions or detailed questions. Uh, so we're, we're, we're uh, here we are at 7.32. I, I'm, I'm going to hand the floor over to Mallory right now and let her get started because I'm sure everybody is ready to go. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me this evening um, as we kind of chat about getting a good night's sleep and what that looks like. And it's been a hot topic lately in, um, in the clinic. I have a ton of people asking me about ways they can help with sleep. And a lot of people's uh, routines have been disrupted throughout the pandemic and lifestyle changes and routine changes. So hopefully you guys walk away today with um, a good idea as to some things you can try at home in order to uh, get a better sleep. All right, so to get started, just a little bit of Zoom etiquette. Um, we can't hear anybody or see anybody, so you're welcome to be eating dinner in your pajamas, getting ready for bed, whatever it may be. Um, but if you do happen to have any questions, um, you'll see a little chat button at the bottom, it looks like this. And you can either make it out to everybody, so um, Giacomo and I can see it, and then also the participants, but if you have something a little more private that you want only us to see, just make sure you change that to panelists only, um, and then it won't be broadcasted to public. All right, because the internet, um, we love it and hate it. If at any point um, I do happen to freeze or you get kicked off or anything like that, just come on back in um, and, or stay put and I will sign back on and sign back in and hopefully everything uh, goes well. Haven't had to do that yet, but just in case I like to prepare everybody in advance. All right. So I uh, just want to start out with who I am. So like Giacomo said, I'm a naturopathic doctor and birth doula at Nobleton Physiotherapy and Aurora, Aurora Sports Medicine Professionals. Um, so I do both virtual and in-person depending on the clinic and the days and um, I'm work, working alongside the great team at both those clinics. Um, any of the information today that we talk about, obviously I don't know everybody's uh, health concerns and, and whole health history. So um, sort of take everything with a grain of salt and make sure that if you are concerned about anything that you do reach out to a professional uh, before kind of self-diagnosing or self-treating yourself. All right, so let's start with a poll. So Giacomo's gonna pull those polls mm -hmm. up. So there should be three questions in that first uh, poll here. Just get an idea of who's on the call today mm -hmm. and um, sort of what the sleep troubles are and sort of where, let me see where we can kind of help you guys. We can tailor the webinar to that today. Do you see any, oh, there we go. 
Yep, yep, we're getting some. Okay, there we go. There. It's a little bit of a little bit of a delay. A leg. Yeah. <laughs> uh, while while it's going through, um, personally, I, I I can share with you. I'm a I'm a terrible sleeper. Anybody that knows me, I'm a bit of an owl. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm up at all times and I j just have never been a great sleeper. I can't remember the last time I slept past seven o'clock and it uh, doesn't matter what I've tried or, or eliminated from my diet, which I'm sure we'll hear about today. Uh, I, I have trouble sleeping and part of it is just uh, maybe part of it's being a business owner, being a dad, being uh, a personality thing as well. So, but uh, a good night's sleep is always is well, well warranted, but uh, I, I can't seem to get one. So I'm hoping to get some information out of this so I can answer a lot of these, but I. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> All right. Looking at these so far, we have right. all people that can't stay asleep. So they're, they're falling asleep. Yeah. Okay. But cannot stay asleep throughout the night, which is an interesting yeah. one. Um, only a couple that are only here because they're just curious. So pretty much everybody on the call today yeah. is having some sort of sleep troubles. Um, quite a few staying asleep and some that are sleeping okay but making pretty right, tested. We're, well we're gonna end polling here um we're gonna end the poll and i will share the results with everybody so here we go <clears throat> there we go yeah so quite a few that can't cannot mm -hmm. stay asleep there age range mainly at 50 to 70 category a couple in the 70 plus and then a couple younger than 50. All right. And then it looks like chronic sleep issues is sort of number one for everybody here. So yeah. um, definitely had it for several years and getting worse. And hopefully we can kind of reverse that and, and get you sleeping better. All right. So I'm just going to close the poll here. Excellent. All right. Good. All right. Oops. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about is sort of what a regular sleep schedule looks like, um, what you should sort of be expecting from that from that full night's sleep, and um, five foundations for the full night's rest. So different points we want to hit on in order to make sure that we're able to fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up feeling energized in the morning. Um, how sleep affects our bodies and um, sort of the implications of not getting a good night's sleep on our bodies as well. Different foods you can consume and avoid for sleep and then natural remedies for sleep. And so as Giacomo mentioned, we will be answering questions um, throughout. So if you have any questions as I'm talking that are relevant to what we're chatting about, please feel free to throw it in that chat box that I mentioned. And at the end, we'll also kind of open it up and can address other questions that we may be um, have come up throughout the, the call that you wanted to wait until the end there in case it was answered. Um, so just save your questions. If you have anything that's sort of relevant, definitely throw it in that chat box and Jeff and I will pay attention to those. All right, so I was like to start off with um, this slide here and it's a little blurry, I'm sorry, but the um, crazy thing about sleep is that a lot of people that have insomnia don't actually realize that it's an issue. So when they took a poll of Canadians and looked at if they were satisfied with their sleep or not, 79% of people were satisfied, yet 40, 474 of those people, so about a third of them actually had insomnia symptoms. So even though they felt like they had were pretty satisfied and were like, yeah, my sleep's not bad, they didn't necessarily have the greatest sleep habits and weren't really aware of that. Individuals with insomnia are twice as likely to be female. Um, likely to have first degree relatives. So genetically insomnia can kind of be passed down. Um, definitely have more likely to develop depression, anxiety, substance abuse, cardiovascular mortality. Um, and then actually can have a, a, um, an odds ratio of five for permanent work disability. So as well as affecting your work life, not only sort of your home life and how you're feeling, but performance as well at work. So getting a good night's sleep is super important. And um, even if you don't think you necessarily have an issue with sleep, you may. All right, so our sleep doesn't need to be a chore. We spend um, eight to 10 hours of our lives each day. So in a 24 hour day, that's like a third of the amount of time that you are awake that we are sleeping. There's sort of third, third amount of time that you are, are living, sleeping. And so um, the idea that you're a sleep is a stressful event and um, you're not looking forward to it every night is not a great thing. And we don't want it. We want to be a, like a thing excited to go to bed at night and feel rejuvenated. And so the next morning you have lots of energy. All right, so I wanna talk off, talk about um, different kinds of insomnia. So when people have issues sleeping, there are a couple of different um, ways in which they have issues. So onset insomnia is 
uh, trouble falling asleep, whereas maintenance insomnia is that trouble staying asleep. And so there's two, there's different strategies we use for different kinds of insomnia. Not everybody is going to experience the same type. Not everybody is going to um, be able to find relief with different, the same kinds of treatments. And um, some people have, may have more than one of these as well, too. Early morning insomnia is when you wake up really early at like 4 a.m., body's done sleeping and just cannot fall back asleep again, even though you've only slept four hours that night. Um, acute insomnia is when it happens just for about a week due to stress, grief, um, something else exciting going on, uh, just something that's definitely affecting your sleep, but not anything that's chronic. Whereas chronic is more than a month. So if it's lasting and not going away and you can't seem to kick it, that turns into chronic insomnia, which it seems like from our poll today, we have a lot of people in that chronic insomnia case where they've had it for a couple of years and just can't seem to figure out what's going on and it's getting worse and worse. And then comorbid. So comorbid means that you have insomnia because of some other reason. So that insomnia may be because of certain medications you're taking. It can be because of pregnancy and it can be because of back pain and it can be because you're not getting a comfortable sleep in general um, and it's affecting your sleep. It isn't necessarily something biochemical going on um, with your sleep, but, but as a result of some other kind of physiological process. Mallory, um, just real quick, there's a, there's yes. a question in the, uh, a question in the, the chat about um, a little bit of nervousness or anxiety before going to bed. Um, just, just to give you that in the back of your mind, uh, if you're going to be answering that shortly or, or within the, uh, the presentation, just one of the uh, participants was asking about, she gets nervous, uh, before, just before she goes to bed um, and she feels that this is causing more problems with her sleep. So uh, I'll, I'll give, give the floor back to you if you're going to answer that. Yeah. So definitely, um, definitely a nervousness and anxiety. Like I said, that sleep doesn't have to be a chore. And if you are having trouble sleeping, um, it can, it can um, every night sort of produce a bit of a, an anxious or stress response or nervousness to go to bed because you're worried you can't fall asleep. But also anxiety falls into this sort of comorbid section down here, like I mentioned. Um, if you have any other conditions that are contributing to your insomnia, anxiety is a huge, huge one where if you are a bit anxious in the first place um, about something going on in your life or you do have sort of generalized anxiety disorder, that sleep can be a time when that can really flare. And um, we'll see how we work through the presentation today on certain tips that you might be able to incorporate as well. All right, so starting off by just talking about um, what a regular night's sleep looks like. So there are two different main stages of sleep. So we have our non-REM sleep and our REM sleep. Our non-REM sleep is actually when um, our body is sort of falling asleep. And then our REM sleep is sort of your active sleep, you say. So there are three phases of the non-REM sleep. The non-REM sleep, um, the third phase is actually the deepest, most restorative sleep that we get. Usually that's about 15% of our entire sleep for the entire night. So not, it's not like you fall into a deep sleep, you're deep the entire night and then you wake up. You actually go through waves throughout the night and um, cycling through these stages. In our REM stage is when um, your body is kind of moving, you can twitch, um, but you also kind of have those dreams where you wake up to feel like you're falling and that's because your body is kind of paralyzed and so um the sensation of your dreams your it's thought to sort of stop you from acting out your dreams that paralyzed feeling um during your rapid eye movement is when you are dreaming and that's also when um this is a section of your sleep that benefits learning memory and mood the most so all of these stages have their own place in the sleep scene and we wanna be able to cycle through all of them, missing or um, not getting a, a good amount of each one of these stages is a huge part to that not feeling rejuvenated when you wake up in the morning. You may be cycling through them, but if you're skipping st stages or if you aren't actually getting into that REM state in the morning, you aren't gonna feel like you had a restorative sleep. All right, so when looking at a sleep cycle here, this is what it normally looks like when you fall asleep at night. So as I said, you kind of cycle through the different stages. So usually you will begin in non-REM sleep. So that's in the state where you can move around still um, and your body is slowly getting deeper and deeper. And like we said, that third stage is the longest state or the most restorative stage. So earlier our sleep throughout the night, we have longer amounts of that stage three. We go back up into stage two, 
And then we go into that REM, that rapid eye movement sleep. And we cycle through that about three to five times for the night, but we actually decrease the amount of time that we are in that stage three, that most restorative sleep as we cycle throughout the night. So as you can see, this long bar at the bottom here, gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So it just shows you that when you fall asleep at the beginning, those first couple hours after you fall asleep are actually the most restorative of your entire sleep. So you really want to make sure that we're getting ourselves into a good state so we can fall asleep well, because if we're in and out and in and out in those first couple hours, then by the time we actually fall asleep, we're in the section that's not necessarily the most restorative anymore. All right. So how much is enough sleep? So as we are, as we grow up, we need less and less sleep. However, um, that sleep also becomes more condensed. So as a child, we may be sleeping and napping and sleeping and napping. So um, that sort of 12, 16 hours that a uh, four to 11 month old needs is broken. Whereas we want a full nice stretch of eight hours in that day and any naps, naps that you have on top, are on top of that. You should still have that eight hours that night and it doesn't sort of um, add together with any naps. All right. So this is one of the little comments that I like. Mom is a nurse. I'm not sure why she wears pajamas to work, but it's probably because she always needs a nap. <laughs> Um, and so let's talk about shift working and I don't know if any of you out there are shift workers, but definitely um, you're kind of playing a, a battle against sleep there with in terms of your schedule and the circadian rhythm that happens um, in our bodies to naturally be able to fall asleep. All right, so the importance of uh, melatonin. So. Um, Melatonin is one of the hormones that's released from our brain in response to darkness, and it actually controls the sleep-wake cycle. So when you see light and your body um, gets light through your eyes, your melatonin drops. At night, when there's darkness and there's no light coming in, our melatonin will actually rise. This is why shift workers and stuff have trouble sleeping sometimes because they are trying to sleep during the day when it is light outside and that natural melatonin production in their body isn't necessarily as high as it, it is when you're sleeping at night. Uh, as the days sort of shorten and it's gloomy outside during the winter, um, that's when we kind of see our melatonin decreasing earlier during the day, have a little more melancholy, a little more fatigue because you have that sensation of wanting to go to sleep because your melatonin production is higher in your body. And um, a seasonal affective disorder is sort of that shift in melatonin production as well too during the winter months where um, there is a bit more depression going on because you don't have, you have that higher melatonin amount in your body at all times. Now, melatonin is actually an interesting hormone because it works in combination with cortisol and cortisol is our stress hormone. So in our bodies, Throughout the day, you can actually see during the day, our cortisol is, is cycling as, as high as um, it wants to sort of throughout the day, but then it drops and our melatonin increases at night. Both of them cannot be high at the same time. So if you, are, if you do have anxiety, if you are really stressed, if you have an important meeting coming up the next day and you're thinking about it, you're in that fight or flight state still, that cortisol is being pumped through your body, therefore the melatonin cannot be pumped through. And so um, one of the really important parts of getting a good night's sleep is making sure that we're allowing our cortisol levels to drop and, and we're allowing our melatonin levels to increase. Now, since a majority of our population that's on this call today is sort of between 50 to 70, this will be very uh, relevant to you. So newborns produce minimal melatonin. So that means that like they don't really have a sleep-wake cycle, which is why they get their days and nights mixed up and are um, up at the wee hours of the night. But as they grow up and you know, early childhood, kids actually have great melatonin production, but then it declines and it declines and it declines. And so when you sort of hit that 50 to 70, the amount of melatonin that you actually produce is very, very minimal. So that's why everyone is saying, well, I'm finding that my sleep is getting worse with age. Well, that's because you're, you're fighting a battle against that melatonin naturally declining and we have to sort of help you figure out how we can get that back up again or how we can uh, find other ways to help you fall into that sleepy state without needing that melatonin.
All right, so um, sleep is very important on our body for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, it's restorative. We know that we wake up, we have more, more energy in the morning after we sleep. Um, that's also because our human growth hormone is actually released throughout the night, which restores our muscles from the day before. Um, and therefore your body actually physically feels restored as well too, not just your energy. Our immune system creates memories overnight. And so when you um, happen to come across uh, any kind of bacteria that during the day, your, body, your immune system is actually doubling and tripling um, the memory of that bacteria to be able to recognize it again in the future. And it's also fighting infection at night over sleeping too. And um, our body is able to work its best when it's not thinking about anything else, which is when we're sleeping. Also stabilizes our blood sugar levels when we're sleeping. Um, and then we have that circadian rhythm, which just means that our, our body's natural sort of day and night cycle is um, controlled when we sleep. So the more we sleep at the regular rhythms, the more our circadian rhythm can figure out how to produce the right hormones while we're sleeping and produce the right um, enzymes and things so that all the processes are working correctly at all times of the day. Now, ongoing sleep deficiency can increase your risk for heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, high blood pressure, and stroke. So it's not just about uh, making sure that you can have energy to perform the next day. It is, there's serious health implications to not sleeping at night um, in terms of how your body's functioning. Hey, Mallory. Um, yes. We had a uh, question in the chat from Brian. Um, he was just wondering if you could comment on uh, melatonin supplements. Yeah, we will get to that. Um, we're going to talk about that at the end with the melatonin supplements, but there's okay. different there's different kinds of melatonin supplements actually that are for either staying asleep or falling asleep. And there are certain people that should be using it and people that shouldn't be using it. So we will chat about that. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so sleep deprivation. So um, it's not necessarily just not sleeping. So yes, it's not getting enough sleep, but it's also sleeping at the wrong time of the day. It's not getting all those phases of those sleep. Oh, spelling mistake there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then it's also different sleep disorders. So things like sleepwalking, night terrors, bedwetting, talking during your sleep. All of those are not necessarily um, sleep deprivation, but it's signs that you aren't necessarily getting into the right phases and be stuck in phases as well, too, of your sleep at night. All right, so here's a, a really good graphic that just shows you um, some of the implications of not sleeping. So for example, his burger down in the corner, so weight gain. So when we don't eat enough, uh, get enough food, sorry, when we don't get enough sleep, uh, researchers found that you also tend to snack more and you pick calorie rich foods over lighter ones uh, during the day. So it isn't also just the blood regulation at night, it's how we're acting during the day from not having enough sleep that can affect our health. Um, a difficulty learning, so sleep deprivation interferes with the ability to remember and process new information. Um, tummy trouble, so acid reflux, inflammatory bowel disease can be worse if we're not sleeping. Um, those who aren't sleeping or sleeping less than five hours are more likely to get colds compared to those who are. So you can see through these uh, poor vision, depleted sex drive, irritability, mood swings, headaches, and migraines. So sleep is super, super important. And I hope this is kind of just touches on, on many of the health benefits of getting a good night's sleep. All right. So one of those comorbid um, uh, insomnia things I mentioned was medications. So if you're on any of these kind of medications, so if you happen to have allergies and taking a, a reactant every day, that is working against you in terms of sleep. Um, Parkinson's medication, blood pressure, I cannot talk, blood pressure medications. Uh, the number of people on blood pressure medications as they get in uh, kind of above their 40s, 50s, it's huge. And those are actually working against you in terms of sleep as well, too. So um, trying to uh, sort of figure out what's going on with your sleep and why, why are you feeling this way? Well, this might be one of the answers. Uh, even some, some certain natural supplements like rhodiola and maca and green tea extract. Some people are on those and don't realize taking those at night can actually really affect your sleep. Um, even taking, like having a green tea before bed sometimes can affect sleep as well too. So um, looking at sort of what you're doing in your lifestyle and your medications can also uh, have an impact on how you're sleeping at night. All right, so we have another poll popping up here.
Jack, you running the poll? All right, Mallory, just give me one sec here. Uh, that's okay. There we go. Okay, I'm launching the poll. Here we go. There we go. All right. All right. So Good these daughter. are uh, some of the things that people try to do before bed. So just kind of seeing what you guys have tried and haven't tried um, here on the poll. So Mallory, um, a question I, I I have, and I'm thinking of you know, um, as as a dad, uh, as as we've all gone through this. Um, now, do do poor sleep patterns as a child or as an infant? translate into poor patterns as an adult i mean i mean there's so many things that we do as children or you know habits that that we develop or is this purely physiology do we do we stop producing as much melatonin as as you described in the uh the graphic um you know is there something that we're doing that's that obviously stress and a bunch of other things come into the picture but but are there ha are, are there habitual things that we do as children that we we learn poor sleep patterns Definitely. And you can see as children are growing up that when you sort of get into a rhythm, your body starts becoming dependent on it. Okay. And so if someone, for example, uses white noise to fall asleep, which can be excellent, you become dependent on it. So when you're now at a hotel and you don't have that white noise, you can't fall asleep. So there are things that as you're growing and developing that become habitual and um, are hard to kind of break because our body gets so used to it. But it also is a matter of as you get older, there are more stresses. There is more cortisol going through your body. There is more or a uh, greater decline in melatonin and stuff like that too. So it's kind of a bit of both. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm going I'm to share the results of the poll here. We had most people voting. So uh, here, here we are sharing the results. So a lot of people are reading before bed. Um, watching tv and scrolling their iphone i i know that's a no no that's that's bad news you know a lot of people uh, are doing it though you may, you may as well have an espresso while you're doing that that's that's not good um <laughs> so uh and none of the above I'd, I'd be interested to see with the none of the above if there was what what else uh people... the other category if yeah, anybody click other yeah, none of the above that, I, it I'm, has an other i'm curious because i know i look at some of these and i say drinking tea well if it's a caffeinated tea you know it, it it's it stands to reason that that might be keeping you up um reading if you're reading a you know a, a, a action novel. book yeah. yeah yeah you're thinking about these things um I, I i'm not well read so i can't say that that's me but but certainly if you're scrolling on your iphone and you know maybe drinking a tea while you're while you're watching your your iPhone or, or uh, listening to music, depending on the music. Uh, that, that's curious, but type in the chat, please. And uh, um, yeah. Podcasts. Podcasts. Yes. Yeah, so that's great. That, that's awesome. Um, vitamin D uh, is another one. Um, the answer is no to that. Okay. Um, okay. Vitamin D. So someone asked here, vitamin D, is there a better time to take it? Will it keep you up at night? Vitamin D will not keep you up at night. It should not. Um, if you feel like it might be contributing to your symptoms, you can try taking it in the morning. Um, but it shouldn't be. It's not like a stimulant. Okay. And valerian root, anything on valerian root? Uh, yeah, we'll touch on that at the we'll end as well that. too okay. there. Okay. Yeah. So valerian root tea is a good one. Um, but yeah, like we said, like maca tea, people could be drinking and that's a stimulant. So we don't want right, to be necessarily right. drinking that before bed. So some of these are good and some of these can also be bad as well too, like the watch TV and the scroll on your phone. And biotin, we're, we're hearing. Uh, Biotin, yeah, biotin is not really a sleepy medication, so that probably won't make you feel um, like dozy at all. White noise, yeah, we'll touch on that one as well too. That's a good one. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. So let's keep going here. So, what does a good quality sleep look like? So I'm asking patients about their sleep. I don't just say, okay, how many hours do you sleep, and do you sleep well? Okay, let's move on. Um, I like to know what time do you fall asleep? When like, when do you fall asleep? How long do you wake? How long are you asleep for? When do you wake up? If you are waking up during the middle of the night, are you able to get back to sleep really quickly? Are you up for hours? If you have to go to the bathroom, are you up for an hour after that? Um, so a good quality sleep should be about eight hours. So you should fall asleep within 30 minutes. So you don't necessarily have to close your eyes and, and immediately fall asleep. You should sort of have a little bit of a period where um, your body needs to sort of wind down. Wake up zero to one times per night. So if you are waking up to go to the bathroom, you should be able to fall back asleep pretty quickly. Feeling refreshed in the morning. 
when people let's say that their sleep is great and I ask, do you wake up in the morning feeling like refreshed to start the day? And they're like, oh no, definitely not. Um, so even though you might be having a good sleep, feeling refreshed, not feeling fresh in the morning is still uh, something, uh, something to be concerned about with your sleep. Um, able to function optimally with optimal energy throughout the day, and then no naps needed. So yes, it's fine to nap here and there, but you shouldn't feel like you have to have a nap in order to function to get through your day. All right, so um, one thing that I like to suggest is tracking your sleep. So there are different ways to track your sleep. Um, you can use your Fitbit, you can use your Apple Watch. There's actually a really cool app for your phone called Sleep Cycle, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, sleep diaries, which just means writing down sort of how well you slept that night. If you are struggling, being able to sort of track patterns. Is it correlating with your menstrual cycle? Um, some people don't realize that until they actually start charting and, and, and uh, keeping a, a bit of a sleep log and realizing that that time of the month is actually when they are having trouble sleeping. And then sleep studies. So sleep studies are a little more intense. Those ones are done in more of a medical facility where they'll attach little electrodes to your um, to your brain and see what the, what's going on when you're sleeping. So those ones you can't do at home, but the top four you can. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about what sleep cycle. So this is a sleep cycle app. Um, it's super cool. You can download it on your phone and you actually just put your phone beside your bed upside down. So there's no light shining um, into your room at all. And it measures your sleep based on your breathing patterns. And it tells you how long you're in deep sleep for and when you're uh, more of just like a light sleep, how long you're gonna sleep for, and then how long you wake up for and how long, or how many times you wake up and how long. It also tells you in the morning, it gives you like a percentage. So it says like your sleep last night was 70% and it kind of constantly monitors you and, and tells you um, how, great you slept and when you wake up and you realize that your sleep was 30 percent you realize why you felt crappy that day um it also can uh, wake you up at a um a really good time in the morning where it wakes you up in between sleep cycles so you actually if you're waking up in between that um deep like m3 sleep or your REM sleep you feel really really groggy when you wake up and you feel like you need to go back to sleep and press news and sleep for 10 more minutes longer. Um, whereas the sleep cycle app, you can actually set an alarm for a window of time. So if you have to get up at 6.30, you can set it for six to 6.30 and then it will naturally wake you up when it senses based on your breathing that you're in a lighter sleep phase. And so when you wake up, when you wake up, you're like, oh, okay, I'm up. And you don't really feel like you're super, super groggy. It also starts off really quiet and gets louder and louder and louder. So it isn't just like a beeping in your face of a loud alarm clock. It um, is more of a gentle wake up, which is really nice. So, Mallory, we got, so yeah. we got a couple of questions around the app. There's a couple other questions prior to, um, uh, to some of the people asking and, and I'm not ignoring them, just waiting to the end. Um, they're talking about the, the sleep app and if the person next to you snores and does, yeah. does, does that pick up your spouse and uh, um, and so on. So, so uh, for some reason it doesn't. So my husband and I used to both do it and we do it on our own bedside tables and our sleeps would be completely different. And it would be pretty accurate. Like I would know, oh yeah, the cat woke me up at four o'clock and I'll see at four o'clock that I was awake. Um, it actually records you snoring as well too, which is pretty funny because in the morning it'll tell you how many minutes snoring happened and you can actually re-listen to yourself snoring. Um, but yeah, it doesn't pick up your spouse. It's for some reason it's, if it's, it's only a short window that it can, uh, hear or sense. And, and so we have a question around a CPAP machine as well. Uh, can the sleep cycle app work with a CPAP machine user? Ooh, I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about that one. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. And the then what's the, name, what's the name of the app, Mallory? It's Sorry. called Sleep Cycle. Sleep Cycle. Okay. It is free. You can download like a bigger version where you can like put in like what you ate that day and exercise that day and stuff like that. But all of the functions I'm talking about right now are, are free. Or they were last time I checked. All right. All right. So that's one fun thing. If you have never tracked your sleep before to actually see how you're sleeping, if you have no idea. Okay. All right, so we're going to go into sort of the six foundations of sleep. Um, so what makes a good night's sleep and um, what can we do in sort of each of those foundations in order to improve the sleep quality? All right, so the first important part is setting up your environment. So your environment includes a lot of different things. It includes everything from your pillows and your blanket. 
how often you can guys can throw in the chat when was the last time you actually got a new pillow not necessarily or washed your actual pillow not the pillowcase the actual pillow let's see if anybody throws that in the chat here twice a year washing actual pillow that's pretty good a lot of people probably like I, a lot of people have not washed a pillow twice a year 10 years that's Ten more years. like it yeah, <laughs> three yeah. years yeah. um so even setting up your having a um setting up your sleep environment with a, a freshly washed pillow can make a difference if you have dust and mold that's growing in your pillow and you don't know that can lead to a lot of congestion and if you have congestion that night, you're getting less oxygen to your brain when you're sleeping and you aren't getting a restorative sleep. You may not even know that you are sort of sensitive to this dust and mold because it doesn't impact you in the, to a point where you physically can't breathe, but it does um, contribute to snoring, for example, sometimes. That in itself can, can be a cause of snoring. Uh, that's, that's interesting, Mallory. I find people will, will change, you know, they, they, they change their toothbrush and they change their shoes and we're yep. so into doing things like changing our... Yeah, our teeth brush every so often, but we forget about our pillows, the thing we use the most out of yes. like as a percentage of our living day, uh, we, we change those the fewest and, and, and the material compresses, right? It gets, it gets poor. And like you said, fills with dust and, and whatnot. So yeah. And you have pillows in your house that were passed down from your grandmother when she sold her house. And now you have pillows in your house and you didn't even realize it's a pillow you've been sleeping on that has never been washed in the past 25 years. It may be comfortable, but it may also be contributing to poor sleep. Um, so we have some sort of do's and don'ts here. So like I said, um, making sure that you frequently wash or change your pillow, um, making sure your spine is aligned as well too when you're sleeping. And I'm sure the physiotherapist can help you out and make sure that you have the proper sort of mattress um, for your back. But any kind of times when you're uncomfortable, um, you're not going to be getting a restorative sleep because you're tossing and turning all night long trying to get comfortable in bed making the room as dark as possible. So um, you shouldn't actually be able to see your hand in front of your face. That's how dark it should be. So if you use an alarm clock, turn it away from you. If you have your phone, turn it upside down. So even if someone's texting you, it's not lighting up the room um, because that can disrupt the melatonin production that's occurring in your brain from any little bit of light. Mallory, how, sorry, yes. there's a question going back to the frequency of your pillow washing. Um, yeah. how, how frequent should you wash your pillow? And is there, you know, I, I would hazard that that using scented uh, uh, or rather an unscented uh, soap would, would probably be beneficial. But can you comment on frequency, please? Yeah, definitely using an unscented soap is beneficial because you don't want to necessarily be inhaling those chemicals every night as well, too, from the scents. Um, but I would say at least sort of every four to five months, you should definitely be washing your pillows. People do it every month, which is even better. But also, Oftentimes that's hard to kind of find the time to be able to let it dry without having to sleep on it again that night because it is a bit, um, a bit damp. So being able to kind of pull in another pillow that night as a replacement, you can do it more often. All right, um, so we also have using your, your room for sleep and romance only. So if you're using your room for an office, you're immediately, when you're walking in to your room, um, if you see your desk there, or if you're doing work in bed before you go to sleep, you're in that sort of fight or flight state and that cortisol is higher. It's immediately is gonna stop the melatonin production and start producing cortisol. If your room triggers any sort of uh, feelings of, um, kind of being at the office or working, especially right now with everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people working from home, um, making sure you have a separate, separate room for your office that is not your bedroom is 100% um, something that needs to be done. And sort of your bedroom zen, so keeping your room tidy and inviting, um, removing clutter, removing um, office stuff, removing notes for the next day, um, and just making it sort of a nice peaceful place. You can put some like essential oils in your room. So um, some of them can help with sleep as well too, like lavender. So just having uh, your room as a kind of a sanctuary for sleep and that only. And then a really interesting one people also don't consider is decreasing the electromagnetic fields. So it doesn't mean your, your phone and your TV not watching it. It actually means like your Wi-Fi. So a lot of people are very sensitive to electromagnetic fields and don't realize it. Um, but I often have people use a, um, like a, a, a lamp timer. So if you're going vacation and you want your lamp to turn on at 
six o'clock at night and then turn off at midnight to look like someone's home, you can actually use that for your Wi-Fi router and set it so that it turns off at sort of 11 p.m. and turns back on at 5 a.m. So you actually get like a six hour window there where you don't have Wi-Fi fields throughout your house because people can be really sensitive to that and that can actually impede the ability to uh, make melatonin as well too in your brain. All right, and I said, don't have clocks visible and use your bedroom as an office. Okay, so number two is routine. So going to bed before 11 p.m. So our stress glands, our adrenals, um, they recharge between 11 and one. And like you saw that first period of time is actually your longest and three, your most restorative uh, state. And if you sort of miss that window, you aren't gonna necessarily get um, as long of a stretch of that most important sleep. Your melatonin production also is spikes around midnight. So if you're going to bed and trying to sleep from 2 a.m. until 9 p.m., 9 a.m., sorry, um, you're also missing that highest melatonin peak in your night as well too, where you could have optimized that. Um, all right, and so uh, determining regular sleeping hours. So trying to get trying to get up each morning and go to bed each morning at roughly the same time um, is super beneficial for our sleep. Our body gets used to that, and irregular sleep times um, can lead to sleep deprivation. And so how you feel during the day is an indication of how if how much sleep is right for you, and if you are sleeping at the right times of the night, and if you are kind of keeping that consistent routine. Our bodies are very smart. When we get into a routine, it learns a routine. And if you're constantly throwing it off and going to bed at different times every night and waking up at different different times in the morning, even if it's like a, a two hour gap, that can really throw off our sleep. Um, a coming bedtime routine. So uh, reading something, listening to soft music, we'll talk about that on sort of the next slide, but having a calming routine can kind of be a cue for your body to turn off and sort of, okay, it's bedtime. Uh, similar to the way you do with a child. We're no different than children. Um, we, they like, a, they like a routine where they maybe have a bath and then read a book and then get a bottle or whatever it is, breastfeed, and then go to sleep. They have a routine every single night and that really fosters healthy sleep for them. So why are we not doing it for ourselves? Um, and then if you can't get out of, out of, if you can't fall asleep, get out of bed. So um, don't live, lie there for hours upon hours upon hours trying to fall asleep. Get out of bed, go to a different room, um, read for a little bit, and then when you feel like you're okay, I'm about 50% there towards sleep, then go back to sleep and try again. All right, then we have some sort of pre-bed rituals. So things that you can do before going to bed. So a good one is a household light dimmer. So you can put a dimmer on some of your uh, lamps and just keep those on in the house sort of at night before you go to bed. Um, or if you have all of, your house, all of your lights on a dimmer, just turn them down a little bit at night. It doesn't need to be all the way down where you're struggling to see, but just kind of creating a little bit of a, um, a darker room so that that melatonin production already starts. Even while you're having dinner, you can already start to dim, dim it a little bit and that can make a big difference. Um, taking a bath or a hot shower. So your body will naturally cool down after a hot, hot bath or shower, which makes you feel sleepier. So taking a, um, a shower two hours before bed, keeping the water hot for at least 25 minutes to stimulate that body temperature can signal your body, okay, it's time for bed. You can also add things like Epsom salts to baths, which can relax your muscles and kind of get you ready for bed as well too. Um, exercising your mind daily. So whether it's trying a Sudoku or crossword, especially right now, people are finding that they aren't necessarily having that same um, physical or mental exhaustion at the end of a day, as if they are about and about going and getting groceries and doing this and, and going to exercise class. And it, they're just kind of at home sitting around trying to be in lockdown. And if you aren't necessarily exercising your mind, um, especially if you are retired now, not working and just don't have as much mental stimulation as you have had in the past, making sure you find that mental stimulation in a different form. So whether it's doing kind of crosswords or whatever it may be to try to uh, mentally make yourself tired at the end, by the end of the day. Avoid napping over one hour and after 6 p.m. So the longer that you spend in that N3 in your nap, the harder it will be for you to fall asleep. 
So if you are napping, trying to wake up before one hour. So the actual perfect time is about 30, 35 minutes, which seems like a short nap. But that's when that is when you're waking up before you hit that first N3 cycle so that you don't affect your sleep later at night. And then exercise at least three hours before bed. So exercising closer than that can be too stimulating for you to be able to fall asleep. Some people find that they actually really enjoy exercising before bed and it tires them out, um, but that's a minority. Other than sort of yoga is a bit of an exception because that is a little bit less stimulating than like cardiovascular exercise, but trying to um, kind of get that in earlier in your day versus right before bed can be beneficial for people. And then avoid fluids two hours before bed. That one's pretty self-explanatory. If you're getting up to pee in the middle of the night and that's really disrupting your sleep, try stop drinking, whether it's even if it's nighttime tea or anything like that. Um, trying to do that before you sort of start your bedtime routine uh, will help so that you can go to the bathroom before you go to bed. And then meditation and sleep stories. So someone had mentioned sleep stories. There's an app as well called Calm or calm.com. Um, and they have sort of guided meditations and they also have sleep stories where you can just kind of shut off your mind. You don't have to necessarily like think where meditation is when people like to think through sleep stories. You can just kind of close your eyes and listen to the story, um, to be able to fall asleep too, which is a whole different sort of technique than meditation. And then reading. So looking at what kind of books are you reading? Are you reading a documentary? Or are you reading something for work? Um, my husband finds that if he reads sort of a, a thriller book, he's okay and he's totally fine to fall asleep. But if he reads a book by Steve Jobs on how to become a millionaire, he finds himself up asleep and thinking about that before he goes to bed on how he can um, be perform better at work and all this kind of stuff. So um, think about the actual book that you are reading. All right, then we have screen time. So this is a big one. So um, I kind of put this as its own category because screen time can be very, very stimulating. So watching TV, using your computer, your tablet, your smartphone um, can rise, raise your dopamine and adrenaline uh, from depending on what you're watching, which is a stimulating hormones. And we want to be doing those during the day and not necessarily at night before we go to bed. Uh, we want to be engaging in more activities that are uh, making me more serotonin. So that's like your calming hormones, just the reading or meditation, which someone asked where we find sleep stories. So um, they have them on calm.com if you have calm.com, um, but you can also just like YouTube sleep stories and just put it on your phone and put your phone beside your bed and, and turn it over and let that play. Um, so then we'll have a timer. So you can set the timer on your phone to be able for it to turn off after half an hour or whatever it may be. Uh, Mallory, I had a question about... Um about sleep stories is that an app just somebody wants to know where, where do they find that is that an app or is that something a website um yeah so you can find it on like youtube but you can just google sleep stories and i'm sure there'll be a couple different options that will come up but calm.com is one of the ones that i know um has sleep stories as well and, and somebody just commented which i think is valuable uh that calm is 80 bucks a year so it, it you know there's a cost with it so uh just it so is but also there are periods of time where if you have an American Express, they give you com.com uh, membership for free. So if you watch for those as well, too, um, you can get a free one. Um, also, any podcast player, it's free and the light shut off. Exactly. So yeah, any podcast. So if you're on Spotify or anything like that and you um, want to go to the Spotify section or the, sorry, the podcast section and put in sleep stories, there's probably tons of them there as well. All right, um, so not only is screen time um, bad for us before bed because it is stimulating, but another reason why is because of that light. So the white light behind your cell phone, behind screens, behind your computers is naturally fighting the production of melatonin in our bodies. And so you can actually on, um, on phones, I believe the Android has as well too, but definitely on iPhones, you can find a, a section if you go to your settings for night shift where it will actually turn the sh your, your screen more of an orangey hue, which is better for melatonin production versus the blue and white light that naturally comes from your phones. And so you can set that so that every day at 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. it turns to that orangey or hue, uh, which takes a while to get used to, but at least um, if it can benefit your sleep, I'm sure it's worth it. And um, so that's another reason why we kind of want to avoid turning on our phones or looking at our phones in the middle of the night as well too, if we happen to wake up is a big no, no. 
All right, then we have staying asleep. So a um, couple of different things for staying asleep. So a lot of people here had issues with, didn't have issues with falling asleep, but had issues staying asleep. So when you're going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, do not turn the lights on. If you're able to see and go to the bathroom without turning them on, that's the best. If not, then have sort of an automatic night light that's just kind of plugged into one of the switches nearby that will you can either keep on um, all night or is more motion sensored so it will turn on when you are walking into the bathroom just to be able to see what you're doing because having turning on the bright lights in the bathroom immediately just drops that melatonin level down in your body wearing the least amount of clothing as well too so if you're the kind of person that gets hot in the middle of the night uh, we don't want to be overdressing in layers we want to keep ourselves as cool as possible but also if you're cool in the middle of the night make sure that you actually are wearing enough layers the, the the most annoying thing is kind of the temperature on, off, on, off. And people are going through menopause and sort of have those night sweats in the middle of the night or hot flashes. Um, I'm sure they can sort of attest to how frustrating it is when you're too hot in the middle of the night. We also have sort of a to-do list. So if you're the kind of person that wakes up and, and solves all the world's problems while you're sleeping and uh, wakes up and says, oh, I need to do this, 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 and this tomorrow at work. Like I need to, I need to remember about that. And then you either thinking about it. I can't forget to do that. I can't forget to do that have a little piece of paper beside your bed and a little pencil. And if you wake up in the middle of the night and you remember, oh, I forgot that it's Susie's birthday tomorrow. I need, must remember that. Write it down. Because the minute it's written down, your body can immediately relax and forget about it and know that it's there to remind you and it doesn't have to keep thinking about it all night long, um, worried that it's going to forget. Wearing an eye mask or earplugs. So um, the darkness, like we said, is great for that melatonin production. Having an eye mask on, if it's not annoying to you or earplugs in, will just it will avoid any disruptions in terms of noises around your house, but it also can help stimulate the melatonin with that darkness. Kids and pets out of the bed. So there's definitely a lot of advantages of co-sleeping sort of early on, but as soon as your children are old enough that they can be in their own beds, they should be in their own beds. Um, nothing more than having a, a queen size bed with two children, sorry, two adults, three children, and a dog and a cat in that bed, nobody is getting a good night's sleep. Not you, not the dog, not the kids. Um, and also it's better for everybody if everyone is in their own beds at that point. And yes, sure, a nightmare here and there that can kind of come and snuggle, but it shouldn't be a regular thing. And then white noise. So we can actually train our bodies to know when it's bedtime. So not only does white noise block out any kind of no uh, noises about sounds around you if you're a light sleeper, but it also the minute you turn that white noise on is an immediate trigger for your body to say, okay, it's bedtime, um, time for me to sort of calm down and, and get settled in, just like it does for a child as well. And then we have waking up. So in the morning, um, when you see in the videos and they kind of just push the blinds across and, and they're like, oh, good morning, New York, or whatever it is, um, there actually is some validity to that. So seeing the light can sort of drop that melatonin and increase that cortisol right away. So you're ready to start your day and it makes you um, feel like you are energized versus lying in bed in the dark room and kind of continually um, touching your alarm, snooze, snooze, snooze. The minute you kind of open up those blinds and see the light, then immediately you shouldn't really feel like you need to snooze again. And then avoiding the loud, loud alarm clocks. So like I mentioned, the sleep cycle, the alarm clock where it kind of gets slow, slowly gets louder and louder and louder is a much more pleasant way of waking up than a um, really intense alarm clock happening immediately in the middle of a deep sleep cycle. Mallory, there's a question about white noise and, yes. and is it is it harmful? Is it? I, I think what I'm hearing is that you know for some people uh, maybe maybe if it's de you're dependent on it, um, like anything you can become dependent on it, or or if that's what helps you sleep. I'm a big advocate of, you know, what, what helps you sleep, what helps you get eight hours a day for recovery from, you know, people that have had surgery or whatnot. If yes, that helps yes. you sleep and helps you recover, then so be it. It's, yes. it's, it's probably no different than, um, you know, sleep aid. Um, yeah. Some, some people say, you know, their daughter can't sleep without it. And, and fair enough. I mean, uh, I, I can't have any noise in the room, white noise or otherwise. I'm a bit of a diva that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but some people just need it and they need a little bit of white noise or 680 news or something in the background that, uh, that helps them sleep. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so definitely it, whatever helps you sleep is great. If white noise is really easy to recreate, which is a nice thing. Um, so if you are on vacation and stuff like that, um, if you, you're able to bring white noise machines with you or you can use your phone with white noise as well. So that's one thing that is 
a little bit easier to control if you're not necessarily at home. Um, but it isn't anything harmful to your brain or to your ears or anything mm -hmm. like that. The, the actual decibels of sound are so low that it's not, um, it definitely, it can be stimulating for people. So we have a white noise machine that um, we got for our baby that has just like fans and stuff. And it also has like trains chugging on another one. And, and one time we tried sleeping with it to kind of get used to it. And that was so stimulating. I could not fall asleep hearing like a train <laughs> going by my house 24 <laughs> seven. So it can be very stimulating for your brain as well too, depending on what noise you're choosing. All right. And so talking about diet here. Uh, so there are a couple of foods that we want to consume and a couple of foods that we want to avoid. So in the consume category, these all sort of have a common theme. So melatonin production, as we mentioned, is a huge, huge thing as we're getting older because we are losing our natural melatonin. So we need to try and help increase it. So um, consuming foods that have melatonin in them, like um, pistachios, almonds, fish, eggs, chicken, tofu, salmon, um, are all really good foods to be consuming sort of for dinner or sort of if you're having a bedtime snack because you really feel like you need that, going towards something like pistachios or eggs is better than necessary than having some sort of carbohydrate like a piece of toast. Um, tryptophan and calcium together actually make melatonin. Um, serotonin is also one of the precursors of melatonin. And then our magnesium and our B6 is also needed. So all of these are sort of needed in order to make melatonin and different foods fall into each of those categories. So I'll, I'll quickly but slowly go through what some of those foods are. So in these categories of foods, we're looking at a lot of things like our white meats. So turkey, chicken, um, our fish like salmon, tuna, those are all sort of high in tryptophan. Soy is really good. It's high in tryptophan, but it's also um, really high in calcium. It's actually higher in calcium than milk is. Um, so that's a really big one. Leafy greens like kale, bok choy are high in calcium. Uh, magnesium, we have pumpkin seeds, spinach, soy as well, beans, almonds. Yes, soy is the highest amount of calcium. It's higher than dairy, which is common misconception. Um, and pistachios are our highest level of melatonin that we have. Um, if you have like, I think it's like three or four pistachios is equivalent to um, one capsule of an actual melatonin supplement, which is also crazy. So we can eat your pistachios before bed. Um, also high in protein as well too, to kind of keep you full throughout the night. I think they're on sale at Fortino's. Mallard, pistachios, so they are expensive pistachios. Yeah, I just picked them up. They're great. They're great. Unsalted, of course. I just say are the ones with the spicy on them, <laughs> the spicy seasoning. <laughs> um, and then things like our starchy vegetables, liver, are high in B6. So there's kind of a theme between all of these foods as to, or all of these categories as to foods that um, contain them. Um, tart cherries, also really high in melatonin as well too. So cherries before bed, if you really want some. Um, eggs. So that's the kind of foods that you want to look as more sleep promoting foods. In terms of sleep, um, foods that are hindering your sleep, things like stimulants, so anything, caffeine, Red Bull, whatever it may be, avoid them before bed as much as possible, but it doesn't necessarily mean before bed. It means at any point during the day, it can affect you. So even if you are not, if you're a coffee drinker, but only in the morning, that coffee can usually, we can metabolize coffee 15 to 30 minutes for it to take effect and it lasts four to five hours. Some people are very slow and it lasts much, much longer. So even using them, even having coffee in the morning can affect your sleep at night if you are a slow metabolizer of coffee. It can also negatively affect the natural release of cortisol, um, which is highest in the morning and lowest in the evening. And like we said, our cortisol natural release and our melatonin go hand in hand. And so um, if we are sort of hitting our natural release of cortisol at a different time during the day because of your coffee, if you're sort of having a coffee around lunchtime, it means that your cortisol release is going to be a bit different at night than it would normally be. Avoiding bedtime snacks that are high in sugar or carbs. So our breads, see cereals, muffins, cookies, toast, baked goods, all those prompt a, um, a blood sugar spike followed by a sugar crash later on. Um, when it spikes, we actually, or when our blood sugar drops, 
there's a spike in adrenaline and uh, cortisol and growth hormone to try and stabilize that drop. And therefore those are all stimulating and making you become more awake. So try, eat, try to avoid eating for the last two hours before you go to bed. But if you do need a nighttime snack, something that's protein rich or fiber, high in fiber, like a few almonds, berries, um, eggs, protein balls, a protein shake, um, yellow peppers are fine as well too as a, a snack before bed, but try not to um, have a bowl of cereal before bed. A lot of people do, or a piece of toast, or um, some people will have, you know what, I have a little bit of um, chips as I'm snacking, watching TV before bed or anything like that. All of those are things that are going to keep you up that night. Um, what about apples and blueberries? So not terrible. Apples are a little bit higher in sugar, but they are high in fiber. So um, they aren't terrible. The blueberries are great. Berries are actually the lowest in sugar of all the fruits. So if you're going to go towards a fruit, berries is definitely sort of my go-to. Um, they aren't super, they aren't really high in carbohydrates. They're not carbohydrates in calories though. So if you're the kind of person that's waking up in the middle of the night hungry, berries are a little bit, um, harder for you to get that full amount of calories that last throughout the night versus a protein. And then things like heartburn triggers. So if you do get heartburn from spicy food, tomatoes, um, sugar, acidic foods, caffeine, onions, fried foods, try to avoid having those for dinner as much as you possibly can if you're waking up with heartburn in the middle of the night because that can also stop you from sleeping. I'm going easy on the alcohol as well too. So um, yes, some people have a glass of wine before or with dinner or before bed, or whatever it may be, but it actually shortens your total sleep time. And it, alcohol also, depending on how much you're having, completely cuts out that REM sleep. And so you actually skip your REM cycles when you've had alcohol before bed. So even though some people need it to try and fall asleep and sort of influence that uh, onset of sleep, it actually your sleep cycle throughout the night is not gonna be as restorative as it would normally be. So you may still wake up in the morning feeling like you didn't really sleep very well. And then last but not least is sodium. So um, salts can kind of cause dehydration, increase our blood pressure, um, increase fluid retention. And therefore when you're waking up thirsty in the middle of the night, it's usually because you had a bit too much salt on that last, on that meal. And last but not least, um, so common supplements. So we will talk about some of these. Um, magnesium is one of my favorite sort of minerals out there. It is great for everything from relaxing your muscles before bed, um, headaches, constipation, muscle cramps, um, migraines, like you know, magnesium is great, but there are different kinds. There's magnesium citrate, bisglycinate. So making sure that you're getting the one that's right for you is important. Um, we are pretty deficient in magnesium in North America in our soils and so we don't get a lot of magnesium from our food as much as other countries do and so people are very people are, people are very deficient in magnesium and that alone can help you sleep better if you're taking that before bed. Um, melatonin so like I mentioned there's certain melatonins that are good for sort of onset sleep but also there are um, sustained release ones that will release a little bit throughout the entire night for people that are having trouble staying asleep. So once they're already asleep, um, being able to get a little bit of melatonin throughout the night can be beneficial for that. But it is a hormone. So you have to be careful with how much you take. You have to be careful with interactions and a lot of medications as well too. So um, definitely before you start any kind of melatonin or self-prescribe that, um, make sure that you talk to somebody about that. Um, valerian, passionflower, lavender, chamomile, these are all pretty gentle, but there is interactions with these two. So um, for example, uh, valerian is, um, interacts with anxiety medication or other sleeping meds. So if you're currently taking a, uh, sleeping, sleeping pill to fall asleep at night, some of these are kind of contraindicated with that. You should be taking both. So, uh, making sure that you speak to somebody to make sure that before you take anything that it's safe for you is, um, is something that I would suggest. And then there are homeopathics as well too. And uh, these work in a completely different way than any kind of herbs or uh, vitamins, but can have a lot of benefits, especially in children for sleep. So that one is um, completely individual and different remedies for different people. So that one's a bit hard to comment on, but it's another option in terms of sleep help there.
Um, I saw a question here, how we know what kind of magnesium we need and what kind of magnesium is best for sleep. So it depends on the person. So for example, citrate is a lot more stool loosening. So if you're the kind of person that already has diarrhea, you do not want to be taking citrate. Um, bisglycinate is more of the muscle relaxant kind. And so for some people that helps. And so it depends on your health um, profile, but all magnesium helps you sleep. It's just a matter of um, sort of the side effects of some of them and uh, the dosing as well too, because some people won't find a, a difference after just one and might need a little bit higher doses, but making sure that that's safe for them uh, is an individual sort of concern. The herbs listed here, so that valerian, passion flower, lavender, chamomile, those you can find in tea form. But like we mentioned, don't drink tea too close to bed or else um, you are gonna have to get go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. But they can be, um, uh, they can be, all of them have like sort of sedative properties, muscle relaxant, stress relieving, anti-anxiety. So all those are gonna foster healthy sleep, but it's not gonna be as intense as a sleeping pill to make you fall asleep. All right, so that is sort of the end of the talk today. So you guys feel free to throw some questions into the chat box. Um, I do have some uh, so contact information here. So if you are looking to um, kind of get in contact with us, here's where to find us. So Nobles in Physiotherapy and Aurora Sports Medicine Professionals. So you can follow us on Instagram. We post some really fun things. Um, you can follow both the clinics, Nobles in Physiotherapy and Aurora Sports Med, and then myself, Dr. Mallory ND. Um, if you're looking to sort of find out more about the clinics, you can visit our websites. And then if you have any specific concerns about your, uh, your own health or more questions about what I talked about today, feel free to reach out to me. That's my email right there. Um, all the contact information is online on our websites as well too. So if you guys um, need to have any questions, you can always call into the clinics and we can kind of direct you as to the best way to get in touch. I do offer, oh, I do offer um, virtual and in-person visits. So uh, if anybody does have any questions above and beyond we chatted about today, um, you are more than welcome to sort of reach out and we can chat. Yeah, th thanks, Mallory. It was uh, uh, all, all the positive feedback coming through on the chat. Uh, very positive. Thank you so much for providing that. It's it, it's it's a deep topic. It's a heavy topic. Uh, we all we all sleep. We, we're all um, involved in this, and it's uh, some some better than others. And uh, uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, what a wonderful chat! And uh, uh, to Mallory's point, if there's any information that you're missing. Uh, some some panelists have asked, is this going to be posted on the website? The answer is yes. Just give us a few days to post it. Uh, feel free to recommend to anybody who you think may have uh, benefited from this information. Uh, Mallory has done a wonderful job and, and she means it when, uh, you know, a, a consultation with her um, to, to chat about, uh, you know, cohesiveness and how, how philosophical um, about uh, treatments. So um, thank you once again, reach out to her. She's fantastic. Uh, very good feedback uh, from, from anybody who's ever seen Mallory. Um, so uh, we had somebody, uh, we had somebody asking a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot of positive feedback. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where are we going? Here? I'm, I'm going <laughs> to try to go up here. And, yeah, there's a lot of questions. Um, here we are. Uh, mm -hmm about being celiac and, and recommendations on anything that, uh, that, that you might uh, be able to, to uh, talk to about to that. So note. definitely celiac is kind of above and beyond uh, this conversation today and, and all definitely more into the digestion world, uh, which I do love chatting about. So um, if you want to chat more about that, then, then feel free to reach out. We will be sending out a survey as well too after today, probably tomorrow morning. Um, and so you can always just respond back to that email with the survey link on it. Uh, if you have any questions or want to chat further about your specific concerns. Yeah. Somebody had also mentioned about, uh, vivid dreams since the pandemic started. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that, I think that's something I've heard even in clinic where, um, you know, people having vivid dreams and, and being stressed out. Uh, possibly over, you know, maybe thinking about uh, the future and what, what it holds with, with this pandemic. Uh, anything you can comment on that, uh, Mallory? Definitely cortisol um, production affects the, the vividness of your dreams and how long you're also in that um, REM state for when you are dreaming. So if you're in REM state for a longer period of time, sometimes you'll have more vivid dreams. And if you take melatonin. Some people have crazy vivid dreams when they're on melatonin. So if you're taking that right now and you're having vivid dreams, that can also be one of the reasons why. Okay. So if you feel like you're having trouble sleeping and you're needing that sleep aid, then that can also um, can cause those. 
Thanks, Mallory. And, and there was another question. Uh, we'll just do one more question. Uh, I think that was it, unless some of the participants uh, have any more, please put them in the chat. Uh, talking about back to the pillowcases, any particular material, um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming non-synthetic would probably be the best, a cotton, a linen, uh, but it, does that have any uh, uh, any ill effect or do you recommend anything? Obviously it, allergens being an issue. I should say definitely allergens. So if you are sensitive to different kinds of materials as well too, maybe one that can breathe well, um, cause it kind of harbors less bacteria and stuff inside the pillow. If it's able to breathe and allow airflow to go through it as well. And when that's yeah. like comfortable for you, cause people don't, cause people only will sleep on silk pillowcases cause that's like cooling for them if they have hot flashes in the middle of the night. Right. So, um, different materials are better for different, different people right. as well. Uh, there's somebody asking about Paxil and naturals to take with Paxil. Uh, any naturals to, that are safe to take with Paxil? Look up every kind of medication that I recommend to patients. I always double check with um, the medications that they're on and just do an interaction checker. So um, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly which ones would interact, but you have to be careful with um, medications in general when you're taking a certain supplement. And, and, and Jeff had a question here um, about what is your favorite melatonin supplement? Um, it depends. There's a lot of brands out there. A lot of them are di very different for different reasons. So it would also depend on sort of what's going on and ones that you, we want certain dosing in certain amounts or spray forms. I really like the spray form as well. Um, sublingual yes. dissolving. Yeah. There's sublingual ones or spray yeah. ones. There's, yeah. they all act differently. So it's kind of hard to just like, mm -hmm. pick a brand based on them, but um, dosage like five milligram 10 milligram what, what would you recommend I, I think i tried the 10 milligram and it, i found that worked the best for me perhaps. i should say 10 is pretty high a lot of capsules are only or a lot of tablets are only two milligrams and so they'll, they'll go up a lot slower so that's the thing too is some of them will be yeah. two milligrams per spray where spray is a little bit easier than taking like four melatonin tablets before bed so it depends on the dosing that you're trying to get as well too but that would depend on the person okay and and another question we'll, we'll make this maybe the last question uh, from lucia um, what kind of pillow is the best feather, cotton, foam, you know, uh, foam is hard to wash. I, I do agree. Uh, but, uh, you know, feathers and, and whatnot do harbor possibly some, some, um, you know, ill-fated, uh, things that we could be breathing in. I, 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 I don't know that for a fact, but uh, I imagine. So if you can just comment on that and we'll wrap it up. I feel like if, as long as you're washing it regularly, it doesn't really matter as much. Um, it kind of depends on a personal preference. Um, so people are allergic to feather pillows. So if you have allergies to feathers, maybe not feather. Um, but yeah, and it depends on the firmness as well too. You kind of can't get a feather pillow as firm as you can a foam pillow, for example. But um, definitely being able to just kind of wash it if it's washable, that's the best. Great. Well, I, I think that will wrap it up. I, I want to thank everybody who's still on for participating and asking some amazing questions. And Mallory, thank you for uh, all your answers. Uh, very candid uh, Q&A here. And so uh, please keep the questions coming. Uh, Mallory is going to send out uh, some, some uh, like I said, she said, uh, um, a survey. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, constructive feedback, please, please uh, send it our way and look to our website for a uh, follow up on this as far as uh, recording and uh, we thank you again and we all bid you good night. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good night everybody. Have a good sleep. Thank you. <laughs>